Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're continuing to investigate various gauche models and extensions and generalizations of the gauche logic that can potentially better capture the dynamics of conditional volatility. And as usual, we'll apply a generalized gauche model to the dynamics of S&P 500 returns over a five-year period. And the hero of our today's tutorial is the asymmetric power ash, or a pash for short, developed by Ding, Granger, and Engel in 1993. And uh, you can clearly see from the specification that it builds on heavily on prior developments in the Gash literature. For example, it uses the leverage effects and the theta parameter that is prominent in t Gash modeling, but the main contribution of Apache is actually this delta parameter over here. If you remember the standard Gash logic, you had squares over here you were modeling conditional variance. However, Ding, Engel, and Granger proposed to relax this assumption and allow this delta parameter to be, well, two, and that would just make it a regular t gauge, but also any other positive number. And they have proven that this relaxation, this generalization of the model, allows this asymmetric power ash to capture a wide range of different gauche model classes on its own, just using this flexible parameterization. For example, if delta approaches zero, then this model is very similar to EGOSH, we have investigated already in one of the previous videos. If it's close to one, then it is similar to models in terms of conditional volatility. When uh, this is just one, then you just model conditional volatility and its dynamics, isn't it? and also everything in between. So it's quite flexible and theoretically quite powerful. But does it stand to the test? Well, that's the topic of our today's video. First of all, let's just consider the baseline specification, that is indeed the constant variance assumption with delta equals 2, and we'll see if our model can improve over this baseline condition. So first of all, our constant mu, as usual, in the baseline case will just be equal to the sample average return, our unconditional variance would just be equal to the sample variance, our alpha, beta, and theta would be equal to zeros, because, well, the volatility is not persistent at all in the constant volatility assumption, and our power, that is delta in the model, will be equal to two, as we resort to the baseline case of modeling conditional variance, not, not some power of conditional volatility. Then we can input our alpha plus beta over here uh, as our overall persistence indicator that needs to be lower than one for the model to converge. And we can retrieve our long run volatility by using, as usual, our unconditional variance omega over one minus alpha minus beta. But instead of the previous version, where we would just calculate the square root of it, here, our power can be different, so we need to raise it to the power of 1 over delta instead. Simply because if delta is 2, as is in the baseline case, that would be indeed a square root to the power of a half. However, if delta is different, then to preserve this logic of omega over 1 minus alpha minus beta being conditional variance, we need to raise it to the power of 1 over delta. So keeping that in mind, we can proceed to code our residuals and our realized and conditional variances as per the model. So the residuals here are quite simple. They're just returns minus the constant term mu, and we just lock the row over here. Then we can retrieve our absolute residuals by just using the apps function onto the residuals. Then we can lag our residuals by just referring to residuals from the previous observation. And we can figure out that our realized volatility is just the absolute residual from over here. However, the interesting bit comes when we start calculating the conditional volatility. 
as usual when we start and we have no lagged residuals to uh, plug into our equation, we assume that at the very first observation, our conditional volatility is equal to long run volatility. But next is where we have to code this function over here. So first of all, it's obvious that we cannot uh, retrieve the conditional volatility Vt straight away. We can simply retrieve Vt to the power delta. So keeping that in mind, we can refer to unconditional variance omega, lock in the row here, adding alpha, lock in the row as well, times the lagged absolute residual, which is simply the residual that is reported in this cell, plus theta, which is the leverage effect, common in TGAR specifications, times the lagged residual, no absolute here, all this bracket gets raised to the power of delta over here, and also we'll need to add our usual conditional volatility persistence parameter beta, lock in the row as well, times the conditional uh, volatility in the previous day raised to the power of delta. And that would give us conditional volatility raised to the power of delta itself. But we cannot enforce the formula just yet. To convert it back to conditional volatility, we'll have to raise this to the power of 1 over delta. And that is all of the formula that codes the conditional volatility process as per the Apache framework. So we can bottom right click it all the way down and see that indeed in the constant volatility case, our conditional volatility is always just equal to the sample standard deviation. And we can also refer to our Apache volatility over here and see how it is different from the volatility retrieved from a simple GASH model that we have encountered in previous videos. And we can also compare it to the realized volatility, which is just the absolute residual. And we'll see that, well, the GASH model has decent fit, but can we improve this fit using the logic of asymmetric power, ASH? And to calibrate our parameters to achieve the best fit possible, we'll need to, as usual, maximize log likelihood. And for the log likelihood, we use the similar formula. However, we just have a function of more parameters here, uh, instead of just alpha and beta, mu and omega in standard gauche, we add up theta for T gauche and delta for asymmetric power effects. So to code the log likelihood function, we need to refer to the natural log of 1 divided by our conditional volatility over here times the square root of 2 times pi times the exponent of minus our residual realized variance squared divided by 2 times our conditional volatility squared. And uh, that does a good job in terms of calculating the log likelihood, but to make our solver converge to the solution faster and not crash, we need to tell it that if there is an error, do not crash, but rather return a very high negative number, so that it knows it should not venture to these domains. And enforcing this formula, we can bottom right click it all the way down and calculate the total log likelihood that will maximize by calculating the sum of log likelihood for all of our observations. And as usual, we get 4208. And uh, now we can use the solver, go in data solver, to specify our task and specify which parameters we can change to accommodate the maximization of our objective function. Our objective function is, as usual, our log likelihood in cell G8, and we want to maximize that, so everything is correct so far. We want to change variable cells mu, omega, alpha, beta, theta, and delta, so six parameters over here, and given we have already inputted the if error condition, we can untick that, making uh, our variables positive or negative, whatever the model requires. And we can stick with the gradient descent, GRG nonlinear, and click solve and wait until the model converges to the optimal value. And our solver has just converged to the optimal value. We can see that, first of all, our alpha and beta parameters are quite similar to what we have obtained in all previous cases, with a quite close to negative one leverage parameter over here, meaning that indeed negative turbulence does affect conditional volatility to greater proportions than positive turbulence. However, 
our main focus is the delta parameter, which is quite a bit lower than 2, but still higher than 1, meaning that the volatility dynamics of S&P 500 can be best approximated by something in between of a conditional standard deviation model and a conventional conditional variance model, as in standard gauge. And our log likelihood is quite a bit higher than the one we obtained from standard gauge, and it's even better than the one we have obtained in e gauge, meaning that the flexibility of the asymmetric power arch model with the various delta parameters provides quite a good fit in terms of volatility dynamics. And graphically, we can see that the asymmetric power arch in orange does a remarkably better job than standard gauge in terms of capturing both the peaks and the trough of conditional volatility. And that's all there is for the Ding, Angle and Granger asymmetric power arch and implementation of it in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm meaning to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.